Thank you for all our DVD watchers and our YouTube listeners. The service is coming to you from Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario on Thanksgiving Day, October the 9th. And my name is Gary Magara, and we're delighted to be able to give our message across to YouTube. Shall we pray? Beloved God, on this wonderful day, this beautiful sunny day, hear us as we think for a few moments about what it means to be thankful shout for joy. Amen. Most of you have heard many, many, many Thanksgiving sermons. It's hard to come up with something that's new and so you don't try to. You remind again of what it is we're about on this day. We're celebrating that wonderful feast of Thanksgiving the time when we celebrate with friends, families, neighbors, anybody who wants to hear, the bounty of the earth and the wonder of God's goodness to us. I was listening to the radio this morning and somebody said, we hear that phrase, God's goodness to us, does it mean anything? But to most of us who are Christians, we know what it means, that God indeed not only gave us life, but is good to us. The early settlers to the United States began this tradition after the first year of settlement. Even though the time had been rugged and together harder than they ever imagined. The tradition moved north and became part of the Canadian tradition with the coming of the United Empire Loyalists, particularly to this part of the world. And though the date of our Thanksgiving celebration is earlier in Canada than the USA, our festivities and our traditions are really very much the same. We know the early settlers in Canada had a tough job, clearing the land, planting the crops, building shelters against a tough winter. And perhaps like me, you marvel at what they were able to do, those early settlers. Not only what they were able to accomplish, but their tenacity and their determination and their willingness still, not only to survive, but to thrive. My forebearers settled in the mosquito bog land of southern Manitoba in the Red River Valley. They built sod houses for the first winter and survived brutally winter, winters that are there, long and lengthy winters. And by the time they did build wooden houses, they had formed communities. In my community, they erected a Methodist church and a one-room school. These people were there to stay, and they were determined to create a new world where they had settled, in spite of whatever hardships they may have found. We have family stories recorded of that first Thanksgiving service in our new church that they had named the Avonlea Methodist Church. The crops had been very poor that year, early frost, grasshoppers, drought. But the people gathered together to celebrate their life and to thank their God. One can only commend that attitude to life and that willingness to sacrifice for a better life for themselves and their family and their community. You know, in reality, the, the Thanksgiving, the time of Thanksgiving for harvest is not something that is a gift of either the Old Testament or the New Testament peoples. Since the beginning of time, there has been a celebration of some kind of a harvest feast or another. Thanks and praise were given to gods, whatever your god was, often with very lavish tributes, great sacrifices, so that the gods would be friendly and grant a bountiful crop the next year. It seems that throughout history, no matter where you are in our world, people have felt the need to say thanks and a recognition that all that nature does for us, the planting of the, when we plant the seed and the growth and the harvest, is not just by accident, but somehow there's a great design in the world behind that. Societies, clans, and communities were sure that the gods demanded much, though, in return from men and women. Granting, if they were going to get any favors from the gods, they had to buy them. Most societies believed in sacrifices, so the gods could be appeased and look favorably upon them. Some of these sacrifices were very demanding, and in fact, to the point where even making poor people even poorer, having to give up their scant food for the gods. And in some extreme manifestations in the world, there was even human sacrifice an attempt to appease what was believed to be very cranky and very hard to please deities. 
that's an important background to our thinking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, which is a chronicle of the journey of faith of the Hebrew people and their growing awareness of how different was their God. Not only one God, but how different and what his expectation was in worship. It's a unique and exciting story as the Hebrews struggle to understand what God was like and why did he choose them to be his people. You remember the saga begins with the call of Abraham and Sarah to pick up and move to a new place. They were to obey God and follow the teachings. One story relates of Abraham, and I think it was mentioned by Ed a couple of weeks ago, relates to Abraham's belief that God had called upon him to sacrifice his only son. And when he was about to, to, to kill his son, he stopped. And his belief was that he, did, he recognized that God was not demanding this sacrifice or burnt offering from Abraham. What he was asking for was a relationship a relationship between God and his creation, a people who would learn to be thankful and knew what it meant to be a child of God. And together, they would grow in understanding through the generations. That's the story of the Old Testament. It's important for us to realize how different this was from any other relationship with a God at that time. The Hebrews' God demanded no human or food sacrifices, though there were times that they were given the food sacrifices, not human. But rather, they came gradually to understand that God desired and worked towards an intimate and community relationship with people, mutually respectful, loving, and joyous relationship in worship and in thanksgiving. This word joyous, the word associated with faith, thanksgiving, and praise, permeates the Old and New Testament. In Psalm 100, which was read this morning, we hear these words of the psalmist. Shout to God all the earth. Worship with gladness and joy. Come before God with laughter, our maker to whom we belong. The writer reminds us to give all we have in joy to God in our praise and thanksgiving. There's neither room, <coughs> pardon me, there's neither room nor need for timidity. He ends the psalm with these words to God. You are always gracious. You are always faithful, age after age. When I read that passage, I think to myself, and maybe you do as well, and I think honestly, are we always gracious? Are we always faithful in our life? Do we hold ourselves back in our worship of God, or do we allow ourselves to be truly joyous in our worship? Thanksgiving allows us give all that we are and have to God freely and without restraint, for we all are and have things that God has given to us, and he gave us life. Paul, in his wonderful letter to the church in Philippi, reminds us to rejoice in the Lord always, whatever the set of circumstances we are experiencing at this time. Be not anxious, he cautions, not an easy thing, be not anxious. He cautions, knowing only too well how difficult this is. Bring your requests before God, who is ever there and responsive to our words. And he ends this passage by saying God's peace, God's peace, the thing that people were always searching for with the other gods, God's peace. This would be a God of peace. God's peace, which is beyond all our understanding to understand, will keep our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Truly, as the old gospel hymn states, and we heard, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. In John's gospel, we read of Jesus stating clearly that he's the bread of life. And when we come to him, we are safe in the knowledge that Jesus is the key to life and our close relationship with our God. The symbolism of being the bread of life plays out well in the act of the Lord's Supper. For he says, he or she who comes to me shall not hunger, and he or she who believes in me shall never thirst. Surely you and I as Christians have much to give thanks for, including gratitude for those who throughout the years of our life have shared their faith with us. Christian, the Christian faith 
is one that is often caught. You catch it, you get a glimpse of it, and you want it for yourself because you see it in someone else. We should share our gratitude with those who have allowed us to administer unto them. And as we sit here this morning, can you not feel the presence of the saints who have worshipped here before us? The heavenly hosts that the Bible mentions that surround us always so that we're never alone. I can't come to Thanksgiving Day without thinking of sitting in church beside my father who died when I was 17, but he would sit there and uh, once in a while, uh, if you were a bit jumpy as kids can be, he would look at you and afterwards you'd say, I'm sorry I didn't mean to look so tough, but you weren't exactly the way I wanted you to be. But I can't help but think about one time I asked my father, why are you in church every Sunday? And he said, I don't know everything there is to know about God, but I know that I am to be there for you. I always remember that. We are there for others, and our thanksgiving is when we remember those who affected our lives profoundly. So this Thanksgiving Day, let's take the time to truly give thanks for the blessing. Time to remember people by name and consider anew what they contributed to your life. Think of the lessons in kindness, consideration, joyous living and faith they imparted to us by their words and their actions. And when you think with warmth about what that meant to us, that's an enormous motivator for us to go out and do likewise to others around us. The biblical writers remind us again and again that thanksgiving is a key aspect of faith. In fact, it's the lifeblood of our faith. For it's only in giving thanks that we lift ourselves above our worries and our preoccupations. And in giving thanks, we see life as it should be looked at, instead of wallowing in some of the self-pity that we may find ourselves from time to time. Giving thanks to anyone who has blessed us, we know, is a soul-refreshing act on both sides. A reminder that we do not live in isolation, but we're part of a physical family, part of a larger community. So give thanks willingly without reservation, and the peace of God will be with us, says the ancient writers. Accept God's gracious forgiveness and live as a forgiven person, free from the burden of guilt and self-loathing. Much easier to say than it is to do. We believe as Christians that we're surrounded by the forgiveness of God. It's not God's lack of forgiveness to us, it's our lack of understanding that if we reach out and accept that forgiveness, we can drop some of that stuff we carry around and begin to live life in a new way. Last week, we celebrated Worldwide Communion Sunday when we celebrated the fact that God invites us to sit at the table as guests. As guests. I always think when I, when I do a communion service, uh, I always say whether you receive an invitation or the mail or whether you just thought about it, you're invited by God as a guest to join in this table. And that's a wonderful symbol of what is our faith, that welcoming, forgiving love of God that we celebrate. Let us eat and drink together in joy and love. And Jesus said, when you gather together in my name, do this in memory of me. And we're remembering not a dead Lord, but a living Lord. So Thanksgiving Sunday, as was Worldwide Communion Sunday, is a unique opportunity to celebrate our faith with the millions of Christians throughout the world, many of whom are having a very difficult time in being able to celebrate, not only by their set of circumstances, but by the fear they live in and the persecution they live under. And so we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful that we are free to worship as we wish. The traditional Thanksgiving celebration with the church has been filled with vegetables and fruit. We see it today, and I want to thank the people who went with this kind of imagination. Somebody was afraid if the kids came up, they might get the shovels and rakes, and who knows. But they, kids always rise to the occasion. But today, the majority of the citizens of the earth reside and work in large urban centers, not necessarily near the farms that produce and the animals being raised. So all of us have to enjoy this, and remember this and also think of those other talents that we have or other gifts that God's given us. Our talents, our work, our community, our communications, our global community. And may I remind you again that the mark of a Christian is being joyous. 
You know, the word joy appears in 155 verses in the King James Version of the Bible. The Hebrew language of the Old Testament has 15 different words to describe joy and all of its elements. The Greek language of the New Testament has eight words to describe joy. That's a lot. Joy is integral to faith. And many times these words are used as nouns and verbs. It permeates all that we are to be as children of God. The writers of Scripture had this common belief that when the Lord is present in our lives, we cannot help but be joyous. With grateful hearts, our thanks are expressed, as it says in the Old Testament, in praise, singing, shouting, leaping, dancing, and playing instruments. Clearly, true joy cannot be held or bottled up in any one of us. Joy has to be expressed loudly and shared. Should we not strive to share this gift of joy with one another to this day and always? And it was this presence of joy in the time of persecution in the early church that attracted people to the Christian faith. They would watch people singing as they went to their deaths. They would watch as people refused, no matter what punishment was coming to them, to give up their faith in Christ or God and God. Why are they not afraid? Why are they not afraid of death? Why are they so joyous? What is it that they have? What have they discovered? and they wanted to know what it was. These questions are being asked today as well. When people meet us, do they see the love of God and the joy of life breaking through us? Do they see what motivates us to serve Him? Do we have a story to tell when they ask us what motivates us? None of us have all the answers. None of us never will, ever will have. The disciples didn't have all the answers. They discovered when Christ was gone, it was up to them. They had to go out and live and tell what they had experienced. And so Christ calls on us to go out and share what we've experienced, and particularly on this thankful weekend. And so this Thanksgiving weekend, let's open our eyes to see God's bounty. Let's open our ears to hear the sounds of life around us. And may we resolve to move out in thanks and joy and service to one another. It may be a blessed time for you and yours today and forever. Amen. Shall we pray? Help us, O oh God, to discover joy in our life. Help us not be afraid to shout for joy. Help us not to be afraid to show the wonder of life and to celebrate with those we love. To say we love one another. To tell people what they mean to us. And to be willing to be quiet, and to listen to the story of others. Be grateful, O oh God, for all that you have done for us. And as we lead this service of worship, may we know that you are always with us, your Holy Spirit surrounds us, and the love of Christ is evermore.